All right, turn your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter, pardon me, chapter 18, 2 Samuel chapter 18, we're going to begin reading in verse 14, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 14. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bare Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing after Israel. For Joab had held back the people and they took Absalom, cast him into a great pit in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him, and all Israel fled, every one to his tent. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name, and it is called unto this day Absalom's place. Then said Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, Let me now run and bear the king tidings how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day thou shalt bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. Cushai bowed himself unto Joab and ran. Then said Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, But howsoever, let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But howsoever, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then Ahimeaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushai. And David sat between the two gates. And the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall and lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running. The watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man. And cometh with good tidings. I'm not preaching on this tonight. But isn't it interesting when the king found out it was a Himei, he knew it was good. You know there are some people when they walk in the room, you know that before they leave, you're going to hear some bad things. They know all the dirt on everybody and they got to spill it. They just have to spill it. They're just, you see them coming and you know, you start thinking, how can I get out? of getting into one of these stories. But then there are other people, man, you see him coming, you say, wow, what a relief. I know that this person has good tidings. You get known by what comes out of your mouth. And I'm not preaching on that tonight. That's just extra. It's free. We'll not take up an extra offering for that. And Ahimeaz called and said unto the king, all is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, blessed be the Lord thy God which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And him has answered, When Joab sent the king's servant, and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. Now he lied. Joab told him that Absalom was dead. He was just one of those guys. He's going to give a good report. And the good report is, we've won. That's the good report. Reminds me of a fellow when I pastored in Manchester, Tennessee, by the name of Joe Hickman. Bless his heart, one of the most positive guys I ever met. I can remember playing third base, or playing shortstop one time for the softball team, and he was playing third base. And Joe was a good fielder, good all that. I kind of played a little bit of all the positions, sometimes good, sometimes horrible. And I'll never forget, we were playing the game, and there was a ground ball hit to me, a little bit to my right, and I had to go back a little bit. I went back, and I got the ball, and then I threw it away. I felt bad. A run or two scored because of it. And Joe looked over at me, and he said, Boy, preacher, way to get in front of that ball. Anybody can get in front of a ball. Making the play is what it's about, but 
For Job, man, way to get in front of that ball. He's just positive. You know, meanwhile, I'm saying to myself, you idiot, why on earth can't you play the game like you're supposed to? But anyway, that's a hemias here. It says, and the king said unto him, turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. And the king was much moved. And went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went thus, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I died for thee, oh Absalom, my son, my son. Now what I want to preach on tonight is the question found in two places, but look at verse 32, where the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? Let's pray. Father... We come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I plead again tonight for the filling of the Holy Ghost of God. Lord, deal with our hearts tonight. Our homes ought to be a place where our young men our young women are safe. They ought to be. I pray, dear God, you'll stir our hearts, cause us to think. For those of us who are grandparents, oh God, our place ought to be a place where our grandkids are safe. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you deal with our hearts tonight. God, change our lives that we please you. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Now, this story obviously does not begin in 2 Samuel chapter 18. You go all the way back, of course, to the time of David's sin. After that, God gave David a preview of some of the things that was going to take place. You'll remember, as time passed, part of the reaping would be in his own family. Because as part of the reaping, we find Amnon later on lusting after his half-sister, Tamar, and he ends up raping his half-sister. Absalom was Tamar's full brother. He doesn't say anything to Amnon one way or another. David, the Bible says, was very wroth, but we don't find him doing anything with regards to Amnon. Meanwhile, Absalom works out a plan to end up killing Amnon. He goes into David. He says, I'm having a banquet for all the king's sons. And especially, I want Amnon to come. Now, that should have been a clue right there. That things were not going to end well for Amnon. Because Absalom had set the trap. He had told his servants when they came in to fall upon Amnon and to slay him. They did that. Meanwhile, the rest of the king's sons all escaped. When David heard about it, again he was angry. Absalom takes off running, goes to Gesher, where he stays for a couple of years. And then Joab works it out to get David to invite Absalom back. And when Absalom comes back, he doesn't get to see David's face for the next two years after that. And the bitterness in Absalom grows. Finally... Absalom brings about a rebellion against David to run David off the throne. After David, after Absalom, I should say, did not take the counsel of his best counselor, he goes out to battle against David's army, and he gets whipped. Matter of fact, I was listening to a black preacher preach on this, and he said Absalom was on his mule, and he went underneath the tree, and his dreadlocks caught in the tree. And he hung by those dreadlocks in the tree. And Joab, of course, finding out about it, took the darts, threw them through Absalom's heart and killed him there. When David gets word, first of all, he wants to know how the battle comes out. But he says, is the young man, Absalom, safe? I got to thinking about that question because you think of the story. It's a story of immorality, of deceit, of murder, of pride, of rebellion, and it's a story of death. It seems like a strange question. Matter of fact, as David goes and mourns his son and cries out for him, you can just hear the pathos and the voice of the king in verse 33. When Joab comes back and sees the king weeping, he reduce, or he, he, uh, he gets after David about his weeping for the enemies of the king. And he tells him the truth. 
He says, if you don't clean your face up today and sit in the gate and rejoice over the victory, it'll be worse for you when this is all over than it is right now. You know, I think about David's question. Is my, is the young man Absalom safe? His oldest was dead. That was Amnon. As far as we know, his second oldest was dead. That was Chiliab. Chiliab was the son of Abigail. And Chiliab is not mentioned really after the statement in first or second Samuel chapter three and verse three. So it appears we don't know how old he was, but it appears that he was dead. Now Absalom is dead. You go down to the fourth son, that would be Adonijah. And by the way, Adonijah is going to be put to death by the hand of Solomon, his other son. Well, this is not a good, happy family story, is it? All of these young ones brought up in his life dead. You remember, of course, the first baby that Bathsheba had died as a baby. His daughter Tamar has been raped by one of his sons. And his question is, is the young man Absalom safe? You know, one of the things we learn in the Bible is that God doesn't just tell us the good things about those who followed him, but he shows us the dirty laundry too. He definitely does in the life of King David. Because most all of this heartbreak takes place in the place that should have been the place of safety. It all, this is a story of things that took place within the home. And I want you to notice some things tonight. First of all, that David tarnished his own home. That story is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll not take the time to read it tonight. As you know, when, it, when the time when the kings went out to battle, we find David not going to battle, but staying in the palace. He wasn't where he should have been. And it was during that leisure time that he walks out on the patio and he sees Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop and then ends up sending his servants to go and get her for him. After all, he is the king. Immorality takes place. And then murder, because once he finds out that she's expecting, he has to come up with a plan to hide his sin. And so he sends for her husband, who's out in battle. He's been out in battle defending Israel, defending the God of Israel, and defending David, the king of Israel. And David has done him wrong, but David's not done doing him wrong. When he can't trick his his servant Uriah to go in unto his wife to hide David's sin, he ends up sending a death notice to Joab that we want you to take your army, take him right up next to the wall and then retire leaving Uriah the Hittite to die. God proclaims David guilty of murder in that case. Then Bathsheba has the baby. When the baby was sick, David prayed for its life but he couldn't get through. That's an interesting thing to me. You know, the Bible tells us that we reap what we sow. Many Christians want to sow their wild oats and then pray for crop failure. But you know, there's a certain amount of reaping that takes place when we do wrong. David tarnished his own home. His sin was known by God. His sin, by the way, was also known by the enemies of God because the prophet had said that he had caused the enemies of God to blaspheme. You know, I'm sure that David thought he had hit it pretty well. But the enemies of God knew of David's plan. There are a lot of people who think that getting up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and getting on some pornographic site on the Internet that no one saw. But it's not just God that sees. Every one of those websites have your web address for having hit it, hit on their website. There's a record. They have a record. Your computer has a record. And you can go ahead and delete the files. But guess what? A lot of those files are still on your hard drive. And they think nobody knows. Oh, but then it gets found out. You can't hide it. Not only that, it was known by the friends of God. Nathan knew. It was known by his own family what had taken place. Remember, David had sent the servants down to get her. They knew, and you can guarantee that they didn't keep quiet about it. Parents, do you realize, do you understand this? 
You owe your children a godly home. Now, I want you to get this tonight. You do not owe your children a cell phone. You do not owe your children an iPod. You do not owe your children a car. You do not own a, you owe your children their own computer. You owe them a godly home. That's what you owe them. Is the young man Absalom safe? Well, he would have been, David, if your home had been right. You see, I believe David... Had somebody been coming after Absalom with a knife or with a sword, that David would have been the first to jump in front of his boy. But to protect your children, that's not normally what it takes. I doubt that there's a parent here who wouldn't be willing to sacrifice your own life to protect your child. But will you live godly to protect your child? Is the young man, Absalom, Safe. You owe your child a godly mother. You owe your child, you owe your child a godly father. You owe your child a mom and dad who love one another and show it and express it. You owe your children that. It's always been amazing to me when I hear these parents say that they got divorced for the children. Well, that'll make you a good liberal. They vote in gambling for the children. They vote in alcohol for the children. They vote in every wicked thing in the world for the children. What they tell you is, I don't care what wickedness they want to bring in. They bring it in on the basis of the tax revenue that will come in for your children. When if they were concerned about your children, they'd stand for righteousness. And if you're concerned about your children in your home, the one place where they ought to be saved, you see, you can't control the testimony of other people, but you can control your testimony by giving them a godly home. I mean, after all, parents, if you can't give in to... I mean, if you can't uh, say no to your wicked passions, how can you expect your children to say no to theirs? Now, I know David gets forgiveness. God forgives him. He gets forgiveness for his sin. Praise the Lord for all of that. But that doesn't take away the reaping. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. My children, when they were at home, you know, I, I understand, I can understand men, women committing adultery because God tells us what the works of the flesh are. I understand that. But think about this for a moment. How would you like to have your son, your daughter, that when they go to talk about you, say, yeah, yeah, they're members of a Bible-believing church, and my daddy was a whoremonger. My mama was a harlot. Is that what like... You see, because no matter what happens, with your background of supposedly being a Bible believer, if you're going to allow that kind of sin in your life... Even if they don't say it with their mouth, they'll think it in their head. My dad, the hypocrite. My dad, the whoremonger. My mom, the harlot. What hypocrisy. You need to protect the home. I'll tell you what. Something like that would have killed me. To have my daughters think of me, their daddy, like that. Now I've got grandchildren. I realize the legacy that God's allowed me to have. I've got these grandchildren. I don't want them to repeat a story one day. Yeah, my grandpa was an independent Baptist church, uh, was an independent Baptist preacher, but he was a whoremonger. He was an adulterer. People, though, when they get into sin like that, never think about the results of that, do they? There's a cost. You can't erase that part. Yes, God will forgive your sin, but the knowledge of that sin will weigh continually on their heart. By the way, long after you're gone. I can't make church members have a godly testimony, but I could give my daughters one in my home. You can't make other people have a godly testimony, but you can have one 
in your home. That ought to be the place where they're safe. I mean, you can't make other families do right, but you can do right in your home. That's the one place where they ought to be safe. Lord knows they'll see enough hypocrites in church in their lifetime. They shouldn't be seeing them in the house. Is the young man Absalom safe? Why are you asking that now, David? Why didn't you give that a thought before he ever brought Bathsheba into that house? Before you ever began to connive, to commit the awful sin you committed. Too late now, David. So in your home, with your testimony, is that young man, is that young lady safe? Part of his problem is, of course, he trusted his family. I want you to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 13. I want you to notice a few things. <coughs> David sin is in chapter 11. Chapter 12, he's confronted with it, and he gets right. And then we start to learn about the reaping that gets done in his own home. It came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything against her. But... Whenever you see that word, always pay attention in the Bible. But Amnon had a friend. Let me tell you something, parents. You have a responsibility to protect your children from their friends. Not only to, to be careful about who they hang out with, but how much they hang out with them. I got news for you. You take two decent kids, you put them alone together long enough with a lot of free time, and they themselves will come up with some wickedness to get into. You have got to be paying attention. Say, Preacher, I can't watch them all the time. Wait a second. You're the one that wanted kids. You're the one that had them. You got a responsibility. Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea. David's brother. This was family. Now, I can only imagine that David never even considered that this kind of wickedness would go on between his own family members. Now, it appears from the initial stories of David in 1 Samuel, like when he went to see the battle with Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you get the idea that, you know, they had little fusses like families do. But he was concerned about his brothers and they were concerned about him. I don't imagine he ever would have thought, well, what's the difference between David's immediate family as a young man and David's family as king? Well, David's family as a young man meant that they were responsible to work and evidently they had to work a lot. It would take a lot of time not hanging around with the buddies, but simply hanging around with the sheep to spend all that time out there taking the sheep, taking care of the sheep like David did for his father. They had responsibilities and work. I can't find anything Amnon had a responsibility for. He got to stay in the palace. He got to loaf, loaf around with his cousin. He had a friend. And he did have a sense of righteousness in that although he desired to do wickedness, there was something that held him back. He knew it was a great wrong, but he had a friend. It's amazing how many young people get into wickedness that they never would have got into simply because they were hanging around a friend. Whew, is the young man Absalom safe? Amnon commits sin with Tamar. Amnon had a friend. See, these are the things that never should have been considered in David's family. These were men of work, not men of leisure. John, Jonadab was the family of the king. But you see, as the family of the king, they didn't have to work. They had servants to take care of everything. Boy, that'll destroy a young person right there. Young people need to learn to work. They need to have a job. They need, need to have a job. I, listen, I'm not talking about McDonald's. I'm not talking about 
I'm not talking about some of these restaurants. Out there. I'm th- they need to have a job in the home. And that ought to start long before they're teenagers, where they have a job with responsibility. When you talk about the greatest generation of Americans that Tom Brokaw wrote about, he's talking about that World War II generation that came out of the Great Depression. These were men. You take men like Brother Wooten, I guarantee you, as a young boy, he got up early in the morning and either worked in the fields or milked the cows or did something like that and then would go off to school. And when he got home, the first thing on his list was more work around the farm. They worked. They had character. That's the kind of character that saved the world from Nazi Germany. But today we're more concerned that they have enough toys that they can play. Are they having fun? We send them to school not to learn. We send them to school to have fun. We're more concerned about whether or not they're enjoying things, not whether or not they're working to learn. Parents ought to see to it that their children get their homework done, but also get their work done around the house. And the playtime doesn't take place until the work is done. You want to help your children. <coughs> but that's the way to help them. The Bible says in Lamentations 3.27, It's good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. The whole argument in this passage, you're the king's son, you can do what you want. We've got a lot of young people who feel like they ought to be able to do what they want. I I get amazed some of these people, the parent finds something in the child's room that the child should not have, and the child is so brazen, so rebellious, they stand up to the parent, you mean you're looking in my room? Who do you think you are looking in my room? Buddy, they'd only say that one time to me. They'd never even think of saying that again. We bought the house. We paid for it. We feed you. That's not your room. It's our room. We're letting you stay there. That bed is mine. It's not yours. That dresser is mine. It's not yours. And if you want to continue to be able to use it, You're going to buckle down right now. What's wrong with parents today? Is the young man Absalom safe? No, he's not safe, David, because he didn't learn any of the things that you learned as a young man. You've got him bossing around servants instead of out feeding sheep. You've got him fulfilling his desires instead of having him do some work that counts for something. When finally we decide to get him... To do some work, we send them off to a place where they hear rock music all day long while they're working there and they work with a bunch of young people who all they know is the internet and rock and roll and then we wonder why they're so easily led astray. It's because they're not even safe in their own family. Is the young man Absalom safe? No, David. You allowed that snake Jonadab to coil about your son. And you did nothing to protect him. Nothing. Is the young woman safe? No, David. You allowed your wealth, your position to blind you to the danger of your son with Tamar. Now, you would have thought, David said, I, I could trust my son. Not in leisure time like that. No, you can't trust your son. I think the thing that amazed me the most after I started my first Christian school back in 1978, it amazed me how naive parents are about their children. Now, coming from a lost home, I remembered how it was. I remembered how we were. I got away with things. I did things my parents never found out about. Now, admittedly, they were at the Eagles and the Moose and the VFW and the bowling alley when they weren't working. So that wasn't very hard to do. When I was a senior in high school, my mom and dad were splitting up. I'd skip school and write my own notes. I was smart enough to sign them by their name and not say, my mom, at the end, you know. All it takes is a friend to break down the barriers. If we were to go to your house tonight, what friends would we find that you've given your children to counsel them and to teach them? I mean, if we went to your house tonight, 
<coughs> How much time do these friends have with your children? For instance, if, uh, if we were to go through the house and look at the Hollywood stars who act out stories in front of them, who teach them Hollywood's philosophy of life, how many would we find? In the videos that they watch, what kind of counsel are they getting? I'm not talking about the movie theater. I'm talking about right inside the house. Who are their friends? Who's teaching them about purity and righteousness? People that don't believe in it? Who are they? Preachers just to show. No, you misunderstand. You have gone, gone so naive that you don't have a clue what's really happening. Is the young man safe in your home by what comes on that TV set? I mean, if we looked at the friends that you've allowed to influence your child in the video games that they play. Absolutely amazing to me. Some parents allow their kids to play video games where they even have cursing. You take, what was that thing about car theft, what it, grand theft auto? Now, why on earth would... Any Christian parent allow their child to have a video game where you get points by doing things illegal. What could you possibly be thinking? Where rock music blares and where curse words are used, why would you bring that friend in to your child and let them influence that? Hey, is the young man Absalom safe? David! How can you expect him to be safe on the battlefield? He wasn't even safe in your own castle. You didn't pay attention, David. What friends counsel them in their music? What are the words to those songs? Is I don't know, that's just that's that's kids' songs. You better pay attention. They're counseling your children. Are they lifting up rebellion? Immorality? Vulgar things? You're letting that young person. Counsel your children. See, that's one of the things that makes those MP3 players and those iPods so dangerous. Most parents don't have a clue how to even find out what's on that thing. And by the way, if you think your child doesn't know, believe me, they've got friends who know how to hide it from you. Who are you allowing to influence your children? What about on the Internet? Who do they chat with? Whose blogs are they on? What's going on in those blogs? What's being said? He said, Bridget, you don't understand. They're only on a blog with other Christian kids. And if you don't check it, they'll be into wickedness. They ought never be on there when you're not around anyway. You need to be... I mean, hey, if you're going to put them out there where pedophiles can roam free, and they do on the Internet, where they pretend to be young people the same age as your young person. And just to get up and chat, knowing all along that they're working towards some kind of a meeting, doesn't happen right away. And after all, they're friends. The pictures that they send are not real, but they're plotting something. Listen, we've got young people whose parents, their brain has gotten so small when it comes to their children, they think, well, they're on a harmless Website, you better be paying attention. Good night, David. Are they safe in your own home? How about cell phone? Yes, I keep harping on it. Why would they need a cell phone in their bedroom? Why would they need that? Our kids were growing up, they, nobody had cell phones. We had a phone in the house. As a matter of fact, we had three phones in the house. None of them were in their room. None of them. The only time they talked on the phone was when one of us were around. And we could hear everything that was being said. But you got cell phones today, they can text. Most of you never know, even know how to find the text. They got cell phones today where they can get on TV and watch anything they want to watch on the cell phone. Why would you get them a cell phone like that? What's wrong with people? Hey, David, is Absalom, my son, safe? Is your son safe? Your daughter safe? You think your child won't get into that stuff? Come on, you need to wake up. I'm trying to save your kids. I'm trying to keep them from a scene like what we see in Absalom now. Hanging from a tree. Dead. 
Now, perhaps David didn't want to pry into his children's affairs, but is that really being a good parent? You see, I believe this with our children. My children didn't need to be like everybody else's children. And besides that, I'm not going to give an account for how anybody else raises their kids, but I am going to give an account to God for how I raise mine. The home ought to be the place where they're the safest. The places that they let them work. No, now he wants to know, is the young man safe? Well, David's a little late now. He trusted family. Not only did he trust family, he tarnished his home. Number three, he talked when he should have acted. Go to verse 21 of chapter 13. The deed's been done. Tamar's been raped by Amnon, the heir to the throne. And when King David heard all these things, he was very wroth. What is that? He was mad. What does he do about it? Nothing. He was just mad. Do you understand where his problem's headed? Does he go to Amnon and say, Amnon, you will not sit on the throne of Israel. You have disqualified yourself from sitting on the throne of Israel. Oh, but he probably couldn't do that now because after all, Amnon didn't do anything David didn't do with Bathsheba. Now he looks like a hypocrite. So he's just mad. The problem is, David, you've got Amnon's life at stake. You've got Absalom's life at stake. David, you've got to do something. It's not going to just go away. I think quite often that's what we're wanting as parents. If it would just go away. No, God made you parents. You could deal with it. Mind you of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. Eli was high priest. Hophni and Phinehas, his two sons. But they not only committed immorality with the women who brought their sacrifices to the temple, but they ate of parts of the sacrifice they were not to eat. And so when Eli heard about it, he said, what you're doing is not right. Give me some of that fat meat. It's not right. So finally God said, all right. Eli, your boys are going to die, and you're going to die not having another child. You are going to lose the right of your family being high priest in Israel. You know, I wonder if Eli would have responded different if he'd have known what this cost was going to be. But see, for Eli, high priest, his boys weren't safe in his own house because he didn't do what he should have done as a parent. David had two other people he should have been concerned about. Well, not just Amnon, not just Absalom. He had Tamar to be concerned about. And all they know is dad's mad. Dad's mad. That's why when I preached on disciplining your children, too many parents, they can't spank their child until they're mad enough to spank their children. And so they just associate you being mad with getting the spanking, not putting together they're getting the spanking because they did wrong. Parent, for your children's sake, you've got to learn to administer the punishment even when you don't feel like administering the punishment. They've got to be punished when you're not mad yet. Save yourself a lot of grief in life. If you look at chapter 13, verse 24, Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, now thy servant has sheep shears. Let the king beseech thee, let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. The king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. Now, you'd have thought that would ring a bell right there. But it says, And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him, that he let Amnon and all the king's son go with him. Now then the Bible tells us that Absalom had the plan for his servants to fall upon Amnon and kill him. They did that. And the Bible says, after David finds out that just Amnon is the one who died, notice the scripture says, <coughs> pardon me, 
He said in verse 32, And Jonadab, same guy, the son of Shimei, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. And I wonder if what's going through David's mind isn't, yeah, and I let him go. I knew that, and I let him go. Now, therefore, let not my lord the king take the things to his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead. Then you get down to verse 36. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came, lifted up their voice, and wept. And the king also and all his servants wept very sore, and Absalom leaves town. Man, this is sad. Here he's talking, and he's mad, and he's angry, and now he's hurt, and he's crying. But he does nothing about it. Absalom leaves town. Now, he's gone for a while before Joab talks him into bringing him back. David finally brings Absalom home in 2 Samuel chapter 14 at the request of Joab. And now he's home for two years without restoring fellowship. Well, that's a mistake. If you're going to bring him home, you need to restore fellowship. Of course, with fellowship, there needs to be some kind of repentance. And that's not going to happen now. And so Absalom gets to where he hates David even more. I have seen young person after young person, some 30-some 30, 30 years of ministry, who the parents provided everything for them. And when it came to the place where the parents said, no more, you got to stand on your own two feet, they end up hating mom and dad. Hating mom and dad. How do you know Absalom hated him? Because he goes to run him off the throne, wants to put his own dad to death. That's how we know that. Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, Chasten thy son while there is hope, let not thy soul spare for his crying. Proverbs 22 and verse 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now I understand, Caleb, they, sometimes young people want to, they just want to do some foolish stuff. You never did that though, did you? No, I didn't think you did. I, I know you were just always just the best of guys. And... Uh, and too many parents, so they see their child do something really dumb, really stupid. It's foolishness. Well, it's just foolishness. No, no, wait a second. You don't want them to grow up like that. While it's in a kid, that's the time you correct them. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. That's what you want. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 13, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod shall deliver his soul from hell. Now, I know the politicians make fun of that verse. They hate that verse. Proverbs 29, 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now, someone might say, but David was king. He didn't have time. Yeah, but now when we get to chapter 18, he's still king, and he has time to weep and mourn for his son. He has time to cry. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, he's got time to do that now. Never would have had to do it now if he'd taken care of being a parent earlier on. You see, he should be wishing that he had acted right. So that brings us then to the point. All that was introduction to get to the point. So let me ask you, parents, in your home, is the young man safe? Because for David, we see that all these problems... They began in the home. The boy wasn't safe there. That's why he wasn't safe when he was an adult. In the home. Is it a godly place? Is your young man safe? You know, we'll put alarms in our house to guard our house from the intruders. And man, we'll have our weapons ready. Somebody breaks in. They're not going to hurt my family, buddy. I'm taking them out of here in Christian love. But they're not going to hurt my children. You have that responsibility, by the way, to protect your family. I believe that with all my heart. But what about those subtle things? What about that TV? What about that Internet? What about that iPod? What about that blog site? What about that music? You've got a responsibility to protect them from that. You've got a responsibility to keep Jonadab out of the room with your son. You've got a responsibility to see to it if you've got boys and girls to see to it that their appearance and their actions are always right toward one another. 
We live in a wicked day, friend. It abounds. Too many people just take their kids to church and hope something rubs off at church. When the question is, how safe are they in your own house from the wrong influences? Do you guard their character by making them work to teach them character? Do you guard their spirituality by having devotions with them in the home, teaching them godliness? Your children need to hear you praying, Dad. Dad, your children need to hear you praying. It doesn't have to be an eloquent prayer. It just needs to be a real prayer. Not something made up to sound flowery, but a real prayer. They need to hear you seek God for them. Plead with God for them to be godly. Do you guard them from their friends? You say, oh, my, my child only has the best of friends. Listen to me. The best kids together alone will get into wrong things. It's the way it is. Do you guard their internet? Do you guard their music? Do you guard their cell phone? You say, preacher, all that's well and good, but what about... If your children's already grown up and gone astray. Well, the truth is, we cannot go back and undo what we've done. But we've got a God in heaven who can intervene. Okay, if that intruder was coming after your child right now, your little girl, your little boy, man, you'd stand in there, you'd sacrifice your life to protect them. Wouldn't you be willing to fast at least one day a month? And pray for your son or daughter that's wayward? Wouldn't you be willing to set aside seasons of prayer? Where you just bombard heaven and you weep before God, asking God to intervene in that child's life? I mean, after all, right there's the best opportunity for them not ending up hanging in a tree with Joab's darts in them. God cares. James 1, 14 and 15 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So is the young man safe? Is that young lady in your home safe? Are you just protecting her from the immediate big bad guys? Remember, you've got to protect her from Jonadab too. You've got to protect him from John and Dad. Remember, when one does wrong, you've got to make sure. I mean, don't, man, don't do to your children what David did to Absalom by letting Amnon get away with it. He's just angry. Is the young man safe? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I can hear those words of David. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I died for thee, Absalom, my son. Oh, but he'd already messed up. And there came that place where now there is no turning back. Lord, we look at our young people around here and the potential for righteousness, the potential for God is really unlimited. By the same token, the potential for evil is too. And we parents have a responsibility, especially in the home. It ought to be the place where they're safe. God, please deal with our hearts tonight. Make our homes what you'd have them to be for your glory. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name.